Good morning. My name is Todd Chobatar, and I serve as an elder here at Forest Lake Church. And it is a real joy and a privilege to welcome you to the service this morning. And for those of you that are joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here as well. I've already been blessed, as I'm sure you have, from the wonderful music from the Academy, as well as from just numerous other performers this morning at, have helped us enter into worship, and I'm very grateful for that. I would like to have just a word of prayer. We've had a lovely prayer already this morning, but to begin, if that would be all right. Lord, in Jeremiah 1.9, you have said that you would put your words into the mouth of Jeremiah. And I pray, Father, that as we spend a few moments together this morning, that you would put your words in my mouth. And that, Father, as a result, we would receive encouragement and blessing and hope for the new year that's ahead. Amen. <clears throat> So as we come to the end of this year, I want to ask a quick question just to kind of give me an idea this morning as to what kind of a year you feel like you have had. Whether you had a good year, a rough year, or maybe kind of an up and down roller coaster kind of a year. So if I could, let me just ask, how many of you would say that you've had a good year this year? This has been a great year for you. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to estimate here maybe about 30% of the folks that are with us this morning. Uh, let me ask the brave ones of you who would be willing to say this. How many of you would say it's been kind of a rough year? Um, you've had some really tough times this year, and you uh, won't mind looking back uh, on this year and saying you're glad that it's gone. Do we have a few hands? Oh, actually, a few more than I thought, maybe about uh, 15, 20% of us that are here this morning. Okay, and how many of us would say that this has been kind of an up and down year for us? Some good, some bad, some, okay. All right, I'm going to say maybe about 40 to 50% of us here. Uh, that's a category I certainly would put myself in for the year. Uh, this has been a wonderful year in some respects. I've experienced some of the, the highest highs of my life during this year from a spiritual perspective. But I have to be honest, some real lows this year as well. And it's been kind of tough. This is why I believe that this morning we have a story that I'd like to share with you from Scripture that I believe can not only provide some perspective on our past year, but help set us up for what the new year could be for us. So, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. And if you're joining us uh, here in the congregation and you do not have a Bible with you, you can reach into the pew in front of you, find a blue book, and turn to page 14. And that's where you'll find Genesis chapter 22 and this story that we're going to take a look at from the life of a very well-known biblical figure. His name is Abraham, and Abraham is well known as a man of faith, not only in the Christian tradition, but actually in the Jewish faith tradition and the Islamic uh, faith as well. So Abraham had many amazing experiences in his, in his life, but this story recounts probably the most difficult experience that he went through. And I want to take just a minute here to refresh the story, if you've heard it before, or if you haven't heard it, and this is the first time, then let's read it together. So this is Genesis 22. I'm reading from the New International Version, and this is the story. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance. 
He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and he placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife and the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up <clears throat> and he said to his father, uh, father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place where God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and he arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, and he took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14, so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time, and he said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and... Verse 18, last verse. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. What a remarkable, difficult story. I believe that in this story, recounting this difficult time from the life of Abraham, I believe that there are three lessons that you and I can take away that can help us in the new year ahead. I want to say this also, just uh, as a way of giving credit. I'm deeply grateful to Randy Skeet and Craig Greshel for their speaking ministries. I've been blessed by them, and I'm going to be sharing a few thoughts of theirs this morning and many of my own. So in this story, these three principles that I believe we can take from the life of Abraham is first and foremost that we listen to God. That's what Abraham did. In fact, Abraham was known as the friend of God. And I would ask us this morning, as you think back over the course of this last year, and as we look on into the future, can you say that you have listened to the voice of God in your life over the past year? Or have there been other voices that you've been listening to? Maybe we've been listening to the news, some more doom and gloom coming to us from the latest daily headlines. Maybe we've been listening this year a lot to social media, trying to figure out how we should behave, how we should act, how we can be an influencer to others. Maybe we've been listening to our mother-in-law or some other member of the family. Or maybe we've just been listening to ourselves, thinking that we can handle whatever it is that is ahead in life. Whatever the source that we do, it is clear that God, even as he spoke to Abraham, God still speaks to us today. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through prayer. He speaks to us through his spirit and sometimes even through the friendship of God-focused friends. 
Principle number one, listen to God. He still speaks to us today. Principle number two is this, obey without delay. One of the remarkable things that I find in this story is how quickly Abraham obeyed what God told him to do. Now, Abraham's story is a fascinating one. Abraham and Sarah, his wife, waited for over 25 years to have the son of promise that God had promised to them. I, I understand a little bit of what Abraham and his wife might have gone through and experienced. My wife, Janine, and I uh, spent 10 years hoping and praying for children in our life before God blessed us with twins. And we were thrilled when God blessed us with a son and a daughter. Abraham and his wife did not wait just a decade, not just two decades, but over 25 years. And I can imagine that when Isaac finally came along, the joy that filled their household, right? So can you imagine that when God, that when God speaks, <clears throat> to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. You can imagine, or I can imagine, that Abraham must have gone through some tremendous turmoil, maybe asking God, God, are you sure? Did, did I really hear you right? Is this really, God, what you want me to do? But this text tells us something remarkable. Though Abraham may have had questions, probably many questions for God, it says this, he took action right away. Uh, just in the first few verses there, it says that Abraham rose early the next day. He didn't wait and question God for a few days, not for a few weeks, not even for a few months like I might have been tempted to do. But the very next morning, he rose early, he saddled his donkey, he enlisted two servants, he got Isaac, he chopped wood, he prepared for the journey and took off. Abraham was a man who understood that when God calls, it is important to obey without delay. For those of you that are parents here this morning, maybe this is something that you've told your kids before. When my kids were young, I used to tell them that delayed obedience is disobedience, right? Delayed obedience. Am I the only one that's ever told my kids that before? The truth is it's good not only for kids, right? But for us who are our Heavenly Father's children, delayed obedience is still disobedience. I don't know if Abraham knew that expression or not, but clearly he was a man who was comfortable that when God spoke and he listened, he didn't delay in what God, in what God called him to do. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that Abraham was known to be a man of great faith. He has a reputation for being known as a man of great faith. And I believe that the reason, or at least part of the reason for that was, that he knew that his actions demonstrated his faith. How do I know that? Well, look in verse 12 of Genesis 22, all right? Just recall this, the angel was speaking to uh, Abraham, and he said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. Now I know that you truly fear God. How could God say, now I know? Well, because Abraham had taken action. When God told him what to do, Abraham obeyed. So God could say, now I know. And by the way, when he says, now I know that you truly fear God, of course, the meaning from the ancient text is not that Abraham was afraid of God, but rather that he respected God. He loved God. He wanted to follow God. And so he obeyed. And I would ask you, along with myself, because this is a question that I'm asking myself this morning, and that is this. Could God say of us 
the same that he said to Abraham? Could God say, Todd, now I know that you fear me because you obeyed what I told you to do. It's a question that I'm asking myself and one that we probably all could ask. And by the way, this is not only an Old Testament example, but in the New Testament, there is a book called James. James was a brother of Jesus, and there's a whole book after, that he wrote in the New Testament. And in James chapter 2, verse 17, he says this, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Did you hear that? Faith, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This is simply a way of saying our faith is not only expressed by the words that we say, by we, when we say that we believe God, but that we actually obey what he tells us to do. So first, we listen to God. Second, we obey without delay. But there's a third principle that I think we can pull from Abraham's story, and that's this. Trust God to provide. That's certainly what Abraham did. In fact, there were two passages uh, two verses in that story that we read that illustrate that. Verse 8 of Genesis 22, you may remember Abraham was talking to his son Isaac, and Isaac said, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire, uh, we have the knife, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham answered in verse 8, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham did not know at that moment what exactly God would do. He was, again, following what God had asked him. But in faith, he said, God will provide a lamb. And that is exactly what God did. And Abraham, realizing this moment, then went on to solidify it in verse 14 when he said this, so Abraham called that place, that is the mountaintop where the sacrifice took place. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the, mount, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham stopped. He wanted to commemorate that moment. And so he named that spot Jehovah Jireh in the original language, which means the Lord will provide provide. I believe that you and I can trust God to provide for our future as well. But I would ask us, again, me as well, what is it that we trust? What is it that we put our trust in today? Do we put our trust in our bank account? Do we put our trust in our career, in our job? Do we put our trust in the government to take care of? Or again, maybe we put our trust in ourselves. I can handle whatever it is that, that comes before me in life. Or are we willing to put our trust in God that he is going to provide for us? Abraham was a man of faith, but he was also a man of great influence. And I believe that there's something important that we can draw from Abraham's story about his influence. And the first is a message to those of us who are parents. I want you to think for a moment about the story that we just read. And the story actually doesn't dwell that long on Isaac, but there's a really important aspect to this story. And that's this. Abraham at this time was over 100 years old. He had just traveled three days on this journey, so he must have been quite tired. In addition to that, I can imagine, as a father, if I had been in Abraham's position, and if God had asked me to sacrifice my only son, when it came to the stopping point every night, I can imagine the two servants and Isaac sleeping soundly. But me, if I'm a father... I'm not going to be sleeping soundly. 
I'm, I'm probably going to be up pacing under the stars, talking to God and saying, God, am I doing the right thing? Is this really what you called me to do? I'm guessing that by the time Abraham came to that spot of sacrifice three days later, he was physically and emotionally exhausted and tired. And Isaac was a young boy, possibly a teenager. The, we don't know exactly for sure, but in this passage, it says that, uh, that Abraham said, I and the boy will go and sacrifice. So he was probably a young man probably strong in the prime of his youth, there is no way, I believe, that, um, that Isaac could have uh, become that sacrifice without, um, a pr uh, what's the right word here? Yet without submitting to Abraham on this. Abraham was tired. Isaac could have easily escaped. He could have in that moment said, Dad, wait a minute, you know, I, you're getting a little old here. Are you sure that you heard God the right way? Abraham could not have resisted if Isaac had said no. But I would submit to you that Isaac in this moment had to have had a similar kind of belief as Abraham. When Abraham told him, Isaac, the sacrifice is actually to be you, my son. Isaac could have gotten away, he could have escaped, but no, he chose to allow himself to be bound. Maybe even because of Abraham's age, helped to get up on the altar of sacrifice. Now I have to ask you, how do you think it would be that a young man in the prime of his youth would be willing to allow his father to do this? And I would submit that it's because Abraham had lived such a life of faith to God, listening to God's voice, obeying God, and trusting in God's providence, that Isaac felt the same way, that he also was willing to obey God in this moment and was willing to trust in God's providence. And I would say to those of us who are parents here this morning, don't ever underestimate the power of your example. For those of us that are parents, we have an opportunity to follow God with such a full heart and with such devotion and obedience that we can leave an example for the children that follow after us. Abraham was a man of influence, but not just with his children, not just as a parent. He was also a man of influence for those that he led. Now I have to ask, if there are any of you in this room who are leaders, what kind of influence do you have? Now we don't have a long time, but I want to be able to just share with you something brief from, uh, from someone who worked for Abraham. Just two chapters later in the book of Genesis, Genesis 24, it recounts the story of when Isaac was a full, fully grown adult man, and it was time for him to marry. But Abraham knew that in the land where he was living, there were no believers in Jehovah God. And so he wanted to find a wife for Isaac that would be a believer in Jehovah. So he asked one of his servants, one who worked in his household, and said, would you go to Mesopotamia, to the land of my ancestors, and see if you can find a wife for Isaac. Well, if you have a chance, maybe later on today, read the whole story in Genesis chapter 24. We, I don't have time to go through the whole story, but I do want to read just a few lines from this prayer that the servant prayed. Here's what he prayed. Genesis chapter 24, verse 12. Lord God of my master Abraham, 
Make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. That's all of the story to recount right now. But suffice to say, Rebecca did water the animals and Rebecca did become the future wife of Isaac. But remarkable remarkable that this servant goes on an errand for Abraham and prays to Abraham's God. Why? I think it's because he saw that Abraham, this man of influence, had influenced his life as well. And I have to ask, for those of us who are leaders, you may be a leader at work, you may be a business leader, or perhaps you're a leader at church and a faith congregation. Maybe you're a leader in your community or in your neighborhood or a leader among your family in your own home. But whatever kind of leader you are, I would ask, are you a person of godly influence? I know that in my own life, I have had several godly leaders that have been incredible in the way that I have seen them listen to God, obey his voice, and to trust God for him to provide. It's made a tremendous impact in my life. And I would put forward that for any of us who are leaders here today, or if you're listening online, or perhaps watching this video afterwards on YouTube or, or somewhere else, Ask yourself, what kind of a leader are you? Because I promise that if you are a leader who places God first, your influence will powerfully impact those around you. Abraham was known as a man of faith, yes, and he was known as a man of influence. But his influence came because of his devotion and his commitment to God. This morning, a little earlier, we sang a song, Father, Lead Me Day by Day. It's a song that I have loved for many, many years. I love the lyrics to the song. We sang the first verse is a traditional one that you'll find in most hymnals. Father, lead me day by day, ever in your own sweet way. Teach me to be pure and true. Show me what I ought to do. This song that we sang this morning, in my mind, is one that we can think about as, the, as it comes to the year ahead. Even as God led Abraham, he can lead you and me. In fact, I believe that there is an important question that God has for each of us this morning, and that's this. Is there something that God is asking you to do? Is there something that he is asking you to do now? Is it possible that he is asking you to listen to his voice rather than listening to the many other competing voices that go on around you every day? Is it possible that he's asking you to obey in an area of your life where you have been resisting him? Is it possible that he is calling you to trust his provision in an area that you have been trying to control yourself? There's a, a quote that I like from Pastor Craig Groeschel. He says this, I want God's will until it's different than mine. Can anybody relate to that? I know I can. I want God's will, I say, 
until it's different than mine. At that point, I want it to be my will, my way, not his will or his way. But I believe that Abraham realized something important that we should too. When it comes to the life of faith, we don't control the outcome. We have a task to do. Obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's responsibility. Our part is to listen, to obey, and to trust, even when we don't understand what the plan is. Maybe especially when we don't understand what the plan is. The same God who spoke to Abraham, who guided Abraham, who provided for Abraham, is the same God today. And I want to ask, how many of us would be willing to say today that we want, in this new year ahead, to listen to God, to obey Him without delay, and to trust God to provide in the year ahead? Does anyone want to make that commitment this morning? I do too. So let's take that to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, Father, as we come before you this morning, we have just gone through a very interesting year with highs and with lows. But Father, as we look to the year ahead, Father, we want to pray that you would empower us to listen to your voice and not to the other competing voices in our life. Father, we pray that you would give us the ability to obey without delay the words that you speak to us. And Father, may we trust not in our own power, not in our own provision, but may we trust you to provide for us in the future. Thank you, Lord. As we continue to worship for just a few more moments, I can't pass up this opportunity without pointing out one other powerful aspect of Abraham's story. Abraham's story is actually an illustration of the greatest story in the Bible. It's an illustration of the story where God the Father, just like Abraham, was willing to give his son as a sacrifice. It's the story of Jesus who was willing to sacrifice himself to take away the sins of the world. That is, the sins of Abraham, the sins of Isaac, my sins, your sins, all of our sins. He was willing to take them so that we might have freedom. As a result of Jesus' sacrifice, as a result of his death, each of us can have new life in Christ. I want to ask this morning, as we draw to the end of this year and look to the year ahead, is it possible that God is speaking to your heart? Is it possible that if you have not committed your life to Christ, that he is asking you in this moment to commit yourself to him so that you can step into the new year ahead, hand in hand with God, knowing the freedom that comes from forgiveness? If that is you this morning, if God is calling out to your heart, I want to invite you to repeat just a short prayer after me or repeat it along with me. If God is calling to your heart in this moment, would you bow your head and just say in your heart or you can say it out loud. Repeat these words after me. Dear God, I need you. 
I'm ready to give you control of my life. I repent of my sins. I ask you for forgiveness. I accept the sacrifice of Jesus for me. Thank you for new life in you. Amen. If you have given your life to Christ this morning, I want to say congratulations. Welcome to the family of God. If you take a few moments after this service, look for myself or look for one of us in the lobby area that you will see that has a black lanyard on. And would you take a moment and just come and tell us about the commitment that you've made. We would love to share a gift with you, to pray with you, and to say welcome in person to the family of God. Thank you, Jesus, for leading us in the past and for leading us into the new year ahead.